Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckus join me shortly in our topics this week. The State of the Union debate, debating the bi-state border battle, roast and toast, and the ABCs of pre-K and KC schools. Our guests scheduled for this week had to cancel due to the icy weather, I guess. It was Dr. Mark Bedell, the superintendent of the Kansas City, Missouri School District. He canceled schools and his appearance on Ruckus. So let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Patrick Tuohy is director of municipal policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. Marianne Murray Simons is a freelance writer and consultant. Attorney Jim Heater is a former city councilman, former CEO of the Kansas City Chamber, and Ron Freeman is a motivational speaker and writer. I suspect all of you will be motivational speakers during the program today. Let me see if I can start to motivate you. Probably no topic has been discussed more frequently on Ruckus during its more than two decades of existence than the Kansas City, Missouri School District. Usually discussions centered on desegregation, the seemingly endless string of superintendents, an unending stream of money, and the typically unsuccessful outcomes. Now the district is apparently doing better. Its test results suggest full state accreditation is likely in the next year or two. While this is clearly a time for congratulations, is it also fair to say, Mary Ann, that accreditation is the minimum school district patrons should expect? Well, sure. We all want our children to get a good education. And Kansas City, Missouri, over the last 30 years, has worked hard to get there. There have been lots of ebbs and flows, as we know. Uh, Mark Bedell and his staff have gotten kids to a point where they are on par with others across the state of Missouri in English and math, which is excellent. I mean, we all ought to be happy about that. That's good not only for the children, for the school district, but also for economic <clears throat> development throughout the area. We're one of now six provisionally accredited uh, school districts in the state of Missouri. Hickman Mills is the other. And hopefully, as you said, within the next couple of years, we're going to have good news that they are fully accredited. Patrick, is this meaningful? No. No, it's absolutely meaningless. Uh, of the 518 school districts in Missouri, 512 got an A+. Plus. And, and uh, to talk uh, basically about one of the things they measure is attendance. And you have a 175 uh, point uh, scale. We might for, measure the superintendent by the same. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> Not very good today. Doesn't go well. But if you score 10 points out of 17.5, they give you 100%. It doesn't make sense. It papers over the vast deficiencies. And, and remember, only 20 or 30% of students in the Kansas City Public School District are proficient at grade level in math and reading. So the school district talks about wanting to increase graduation rates to 90% next year, but it is meaningless. When you say at grade <coughs> level, that is a student performs as he or she is expected to at that particular age That's right. and at that particular and, and it's, level of education. It's awfully low. Jim, I'm going to call on your Chamber of Commerce years, if I may. Uh, we've often heard people say one of the deterrents to getting more business in Kansas City is the Kansas City, Missouri School District, the fact that it was not accredited. Would accreditation make a difference to businesses seeking to locate in Kansas City? Mike, accreditation would make a difference. Uh, you know, it's interesting over the years that I worked in economic development uh, on economic development issues, we heard that a lot. And it's not just about the Kansas City, Missouri School District. Uh, too often, particularly businesses from outside the Kansas City area, would lump all of our school districts uh, in together because the Kansas City, Missouri District bears the name Kansas City. And so there was a general feeling, and to some extent still is, that the quality of public schools in Kansas City is not good. When in fact, the quality of public education in greater Kansas City, including most 
coast areas of Kansas City, Missouri is actually excellent. So it does make a difference, and, and this is an important uh, first step. I couldn't disagree more with Patrick Tui about the, uh, when he says this is meaningless. I think it is significant, uh, and I congratulate the district because I know we all do on those scores. Having said that, if you use a football analogy, uh, this is a good, well-played first half. Now well, they have to be accredited uh, next year with the same kind of results. All right, Ron, would you resolve the differences between Jim and Patrick? <laughs> well, I've, I've got it settled. You know, you guys just listen to me. No, I think what you have, it's, it is a very significant accomplishment for the community and for the school district. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a significant accomplishment in that everybody else is already there. So what you have is a community that's been, for 30 years, you haven't, you haven't been there. So yeah, it's a great accomplishment to say, okay, we crossed that line, but if we stop there as if we've made it, then we've got problems. But I think if it's just a first step to a long chain of success, yeah, it could be fantastic. But, but Jim, it's... wasn't there a time the Kansas City District was fully accredited? Absolutely, there was a time. This is not the first time if, if that's achieved next no, year. No, if, if you went back uh, over 40 years when my wife and I first moved to Kansas City, the Kansas City, Missouri District was one of the top school districts in the state of Missouri. One of the very top, almost 85,000 students. It's maybe 15,000 today. So it's had a lot of ups and downs, as Marianne pointed out, but a lot of those have been down. So this is an important achievement, but there's still important work to be done over the next well, year. And I think it's important to point out what you just did. When the district was fully accredited years ago, it had thousands more students than it has today. Absolutely correct. So the upward trend is, is worth noting, and we hope they stay on that. Final word to Patrick. Uh, the best news for people in Kansas City is that unlike lots of places in Missouri, uh, parents here have school choice. Forty percent of the kids in the Kansas City school district, the public school district, go to charter schools. They are outperforming their colleagues in the public school. All right, we have uh, more education news. Uh, Three-eighths of a cent sales tax for pre-K education is headed for Kansas City's April ballot. This is one part of Mayor Sly James' efforts to improve education in the city's public private and parochial school systems. As you've heard, some school officials oppose it for a variety of reasons. Uh, Dr. Bedell is one of them. If he had been here, we would have him explain why. But we know he's opposed to it. Is there a reason to support the pre-K tax? Jim Heater. Mike, I think there's definitely a reason to support the tax. I had the opportunity to discuss this at some length with Mayor Sly James uh, late last week. Uh, it's his proposal, and he's working hard to get it approved by the voters in April. No tax proposal is perfect. There are pros and cons uh, about this one. Having said that, I applaud Mayor James for being on the right track in terms of uh, preschool education for our for our young people. There's probably nothing more important that we could do in the Kansas City community and frankly in our society as a whole than preschool education. The statistics are very, very clear. If a child is reading at third grade level when he or she is in the third grade, they have an excellent chance of, of societal success. They'll be a success in our society. If they are not, that is the exact reverse is true. Up to the third grade, you're learning to read. Beyond the third grade, you're reading to learn. So every initiative that the mayor has made since he took office has been focused on getting kids in Kansas City to read at grade level in the third grade, and the preschool education is an important component well, of that. You go to kindergarten at what, five? At yes. five. So we're talking about three and three, four Three and four, olds? basically. Three and four, and in some cases, five. That is exactly correct. And what's interesting is around the country, this movement is, is gaining enormous momentum locally and statewide. People are recognizing, as they do in a lot of other countries, how important preschool education is. Get the kids ready well, well, to go to kindergarten. Well, what do they teach? three and four year olds. I don't know what they teach them, but but you know, Jim talks about if you can read at third grade, you're set up to learn, and that's absolutely true. The problem is in Head Start programs, for example, the benefits of this pre-K education disappear by third grade. You see them initially, and then by the time third grade rolls around, uh, they go away. And are we going to, to teach kids in pre-K and then turn them over to the Kansas City Public School District? And, and have the Kansas City Public School District waste the opportunity to take uh, what these kids have learned. Uh, it, the, the cost is, is about $30 million a year. It's a regressive sales tax that the mayor wants to impose. And Jim, how about this for a proposal? Tell your friends in Kansas City who take money in economic development away from the schools, J.E. Dunn, Burns and Mack, Cerner, say, guys, give back the money you've taken from the schools. It's $26 million a year in the Kansas City Public School District alone. 
and we can pay for pre-K without soaking the poor. Did you take notes on that, Jim? Are you ready to get with <laughs> I, I, I took notes, Mike, and I will, uh, I will treat them appropriately. Uh, Mary Ann, you're a mother, and shockingly enough, uh, recently a first-time grandmother. Uh, are you in favor of this idea of pre-K education and taxing people to pay for it? This dates back years with me. My daughters are 30 and 31. Um, early childhood education is the most important thing that a parent and a school district and a community can do for its children. This is positioning people in the first three years of life and then beyond to be successful in life. And we have to invest in that, be it through this tax or through other means. It is absolutely money well spent that lives for years with that child. Is that education as important as teaching a child of two or three or four how to throw a football? Uh, nowhere near as important as that, especially if it's, you know, if it's Patrick Mahomes. Uh, but no, you have, uh, the thing in reality is you, it's an issue we want, want to address. You've got to teach kids to read. That's where we're behind, and a lot of those kids are going to be behind if something's not done. Is this the best plan? I think it has to be vetted and think it through. The opposition seems to be more about the benefit parochial schools or private schools may have. Right. Than and, anything else. and the money is controlled by a board appointed by the mayor who I think also serves on that board. Right. But you look at parochial schools, private schools, the target's going to be low income families anyway. Why not help those kids as well as everybody else, no matter where they're going to go to school? But well, the bottom line, you got to get them ready to but, read. But Which Ron, is what you don't Head like Start is all about, Ron, is helping Ron, those disadvantaged children. You don't like tax increases. No, I don't like tax increases. Just this one. No, no, I, it's so, um, did I sound like as favorable? <laughs> I'm saying the issue needs to be addressed. I think the issue, whenever you talk about taxes in Kansas City, where is it going to go? Is it going to actually benefit the people you're saying it's going to? Or is yeah. it, where is it going to, what's going to happen? So accountability has to be built in, and I think they've got to earn the public's trust at some level before you go down this path. Ron, Ron's exactly right. The, the devil's in the details, and the three reasons the school district uh, released that they opposed this had nothing to do with educating children. It was about turf warfare and it was about controlling the money. And, and in regard to what uh, Jim and Mary have said, absolutely, wouldn't it be great if we had a program that worked? But, but not all the programs work, and the research shows that the benefits aren't lasting long. So, so it's not enough to say, we've got a great idea, let's dump a bun of money, bunch of money into it. In Kansas City, we do that all the time, and the programs fail. We need a program that works, and there's all no right. indication we've got to wrap that it this up. does. Did any of you have pre-K education? I don't think so. I did not. In fact, uh, I didn't even have kindergarten education. Maybe that explains what. Maybe that explains what. Maybe it shows. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> what has frequently been called a border war or an eco devo economic development war between Missouri and Kansas is about one thing: competition, the effort to move businesses and industries, and ultimately tax dollars from one side of state line to the other. From Kansas City, Missouri to Johnson County, Kansas, from Johnson County to Kansas City, from Kansas City to Wyandotte County, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some analysts think these battles are coming to an end. There's apparently reason to believe that the governors of Missouri and Kansas, Parson and Kelly, Republican and Democrat, are planning to meet and seek some path forward. I know you study this type of thing at the Show Me Institute, Patrick, so are these border wars bad for a community? They are a tremendous expense, right? Diverting money from schools to Jim's friends uh, uh, so that they can build <laughs> world headquarters for themselves, uh, as Burns and Mac did, as J.E. Uh, GE Dunn did. A, a tremendous expense, and, and the research indicates there is no gain. There is absolutely no gain. Uh, the W.E. Uh, Upjohn um, Education Institute said that 75% of the dollars spent uh, fund things that businesses would have done anyway. It is a tremendous waste of money, uh, but, but developers love it, right? It helps them. It's a, it's a benefit to them. Um, I think it would be great if the governors of Kansas and Missouri got together and decided to have a ceasefire, but, but even if Kansas wants to keep doing it, Missouri should stop, Kansas City should stop. It doesn't work. It doesn't create jobs. We don't need uh, the other side. If they want to be fools and waste money on it, let them. But it absolutely has to come to a stop. Jim, it's about competition, I think, as I suggested in the introduction. Why is competition bad? Well, what tends to happen is between Missouri and Kansas with the various uh, tax breaks and, 
and uh, abatements that are available in both states, uh, both at the county, local, and state level. What tends to happen is that they compete in giving away tax base. And that's totally unnecessary and inappropriate when you're simply moving a business from one side of the state line to the other. I think people in the uh, business community have recognized that for a long time and have been leaders in, um, in seeking a truce on this between Missouri and Kansas. It's interesting to note that a few years ago, the Missouri legislature and the governor actually passed legislation which would have accomplished this, but Kansas Governor Sam Brambach wouldn't support it and wouldn't sign it. And, and I think there's a good likelihood that that'll happen again. Now, a few years ago, the Greater Kansas City Chamber what, of Commerce. What will happen what again? That the, the governor of Kansas won't won't go along? Oh no, that there will be won't legislation. Well. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. There will be legislation it's, in Missouri and Kansas Jim. that would essentially <laughs> do that, and that's appreciated. But I think Governor Parson and Governor Kelly would be proponents of that, and I think it'd be good for Kansas City. The thing that I would like to see, though, more is beyond that. I'd like to see Kansas and Missouri cooperate more, play better together in attracting. Um, true, significant outside businesses to the greater Kansas City area, whether they're located in Missouri or in Kansas, uh, there's a great opportunity there. That's a pretty good point, is it not, Ron, that if uh, the two states were to work together and try to mutually benefit the area instead of just one state or the other state? I think it's a great idea, but I don't think it's realistic because everybody's got their interest. And that's what we have to work towards. Missouri does what it needs. Kansas does what it needs. I think we, and you move the ball forward, this idea of the border war, it's going to be there because there's economic competition. Everybody wants more. Getting the state, getting the municipalities out of it is what, you, what needs to happen and let the businesses do what they need to do. We spend our time and effort looking to attract people from from Chicago, from San Francisco, get those people to move in here versus getting me to move my business from 435 and Warnell to 435 and Metcalf. I mean, All right. does uh, make sense? It's about net new jobs, Mike. I mean, that's the real issue that we ought to be looking at metropolitan-wide. And the way that we've been scooting businesses back and forth with a lot of dollars the going behind them. The jobs stay the same. Yeah, yeah, there is hardly any increase in net new jobs, and that's a problem, and that's what people ought to be thinking okay, about. Okay, before we move on to another completely different topic, let me introduce a completely different topic. There's news about the KCI and its future. That's right. Uh, so the city council had a meeting today. The uh, airline, Steve Cisneros, who's an employee of Southwest, but who is representing all the airlines, came in and made a counteroffer basically uh, took the Edgemore bid and said, we don't want to pay that, uh, and made a, uh, said, we'll pay about $1.5 billion, which is roughly 10% under what Edgemore had said. Uh, we learned that the planning will take about a year, and it won't be until we're 80% through the planning that we will know uh, what the real cost is that we haven't known Does for years. Does that sound right to you, Jim? Is that what's going to happen? Well, what's happened with the airlines is, is very important. The airlines have among themselves reached an agreement on the kind of airport, uh, the new terminal we should have, and what it should cost. That will now go to the city council, and then the next step is for the council and the city of Kansas City, Missouri, to enter into a development agreement with Edgemore. The Kansas City Star wrote a pretty good editorial this morning about that, as a matter of fact, which basically said in the next 30 days that needs to happen and we get the need to get this project approved. Moving, Should move moving, the project agree. forward. Absolutely. All correct. right. Good. Article 2, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution, I was just reading that casually the other day, <laughs> mandates that the president shall give to the Congress information for the State of the Union and recommend to their, for their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. Speaking to a joint session of the Congress, the 45th president, Donald J. Trump, as expected, talked about what was likely the most contentious issue of the night, the border wall. In the past, most of the people in this room voted for a wall, but the proper wall never got built. I will get it built. The Democratic response was given by Stacey Abrams, a former Georgia state legislator who almost won the November governor's race and is seen as a rising star of the party. Abrams talked about the recent government shutdown. The shutdown was a stunt engineered by the president of the United States, one that defied every tenet of fairness and abandoned not just our people, but our values. Ron, let's start with you. How did President Trump do in the State of the Union? I, I thought he hit a grand slam. I thought he emphasized successes in the economy. I thought the, he, the, the idea of uh, protecting our borders is essential, but he really hit a home run when he talked about the contrast of what 
Republicans want to see, which is a free society, our foundation, restored, rebuilt, and, and advanced, versus a socialist uh, dynamic in, in our government. And uh, he won the proof of the pudding for him, though, is CNN poll, right? And con <clears throat> conservatives aren't there. 72% approved. 76 on CBS. Yeah, he had a home run. It was a great night for the president. I thought CNN meant conservative news network. Yeah, right there. I mean, it doesn't. Uh, can you buy uh, Ron's analysis, Jim? I could buy a couple of his words, uh, <laughs> home run and grand slam. <laughs> but but I but I, I think that that I would apply those to the uh, to Stacey Abrams uh, and her and her. Um, Reaction, her response, uh, I thought she did a terrific job. I thought the visuals were terrific. What you saw with Stacey Abrams is uh, a relatively younger person, uh, a woman, uh, an African-American, uh, backed by a lot of people who show the diversity of the, of the coalition that supports what Stacey Abrams had to say around the country. Um, I also like the fact that she didn't really attack uh, President Trump directly or personally. What she really talked about was uh, issues like Medicaid expansion, the economy, issue health care that are important to the American people. I do think that in the Democratic response that's important. I don't think it's a political winner just to be against Trump. I think you have to stand for something and I thought she did an excellent job of conveying that. Marianne, I'm sure you enjoyed the president's presentation. What did you like most? Well, he had um, an interesting speech writer who needed a little bit of a grammar lesson, I think, based on um, some of what was conveyed. My favorite line was, if there's going to be peace and legislation, there can't be war and investigation. <laughs> He didn't really explain what he was talking about, but he threw that out as kind of a catchphrase that I think he hopes is going to become a hook that people can attach themselves to. I, I found it uh, very disjointed. I couldn't follow a train of thought through what he was saying, and I was so disappointed that nothing was said beyond talking about illegal immigrants about the need for gun control in this country, which I think is a huge issue. And this was an opportunity when he was supposed to be talking unity that would have drawn together both sides of the fence. I, I was eager to see how Democrats in the audience would respond to the Trump speech. I'm sure you watched. What did you think of the reaction from the Democrats in the audience? Uh, I didn't watch. I hate the state of the union. <laughs> I think it needs to go away. It feels like we're in a monarchy, and uh, it's a show, and you end up with what we saw today, which is Republicans like what a Republican has to say, Democrats like what a Democrat has to say. In three days, it's all forgotten. It's a Rorschach <clears throat> test, and uh, I, I wish Nancy Pelosi would have never invited the president, and we could have moved on uh, without this. Uh, the only reason that it's delivered in person at the U.S. Capitol is because television covers it and is available by media. Uh, originally, the State of the Union was a written document just delivered to mm -hmm. the uh, Congress, right. and Woodrow Wilson was the first president, I know he's one of your favorites, who uh, <laughs> delivered it in person, and since that time, it's delivered in person by the president every year. Uh, what did you think of the Speaker of the House and the way she reacted to the speech? Well, I think that was a, a win for the president. When you have her posture and behind him and then the fact that she's controlling the Democrats to get up and applaud and sit back down, it's like, what's going on here? Uh, but I think the, the bigger thing, it spoke to what he's up against in, in Congress. It's, you, that's not a mature, that's not an adult response. That is somebody who's chosen to be combative. I think with Stacey Abrams as well, she created every divisive manner you could bring about race, gender, uh, the, the gun control issue, really, which is, again, that's a continue, it's a traditional liberal positions on everything. This is what they brought out, and that's where they want to have the, the war, and it's really, there's no fight there. We already won it. The president said we will never be a socialist country. We were born free and will stay free. Anybody disagree with that? Bernie I, Sanders. <laughs> he had an interesting Nancy look Pelosi. on his face Alexandria, during the presentation. Uh, yeah. What's her name? Uh, Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And now we head to the soapbox for roast and toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to imply, defy, or deny. And let's start with Jim. Mike, yesterday in Jefferson City, Governor Mike Parson personally presented the annual awards of the Missouri Arts Council. And in doing that, he presented to the Kansas City Symphony the award for Outstanding Missouri Arts Organization of the Year. That is a, 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 an extraordinary recognition, well-deserved for our Kansas City Symphony. And um, I congratulate our executive director, 
Frank Burns, the chairman of the board, Bill Lyons, and our fabulous musicians at the Kansas City Symphony for being Missouri's outstanding arts organization for 2019. It is a great organization. It I is agree. indeed. Uh, and I should point out that, by the way, it's performing this weekend, weekend in Hellsburg Hall. So if our viewers haven't seen the Kansas City Symphony in a while, this is a great opportunity to go online, get a ticket, and see uh, the symphony perform Friday night, Saturday night, or Sunday afternoon. Great deal more than 30 seconds. Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> a toast to U.S. Senator Bill Sass for his effort to afford federal protections to infants delivered alive during attempted abortions. Recent, recent legislation in New York and Virginia permitting infanticide underscore the need to protect these babies. If we cannot agree to protect the life of infants, what is the point of discussing lesser issues like education or economics or immigration? We are in danger of losing our very humanity. Ron? I have a, a toast on a lighter side with uh, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes was chosen as the league MVP, <coughs> excuse me, league MVP, first chief to do so. But more importantly, in his spare time, he works to rebuild homes for veterans. And I just think he's an example for all of us. Marianne. We talked about the border war earlier. I'd like to talk about the Sunflower Showdown and congratulate my fellow K-State Wildcats for the big win over KU this oh, week. Yeah. It was huge. It doesn't happen very often. We have to take advantage of it while we can, and uh, maybe that can lead the way towards some more cooperation in the metropolitan area amongst both sides of that line. And finally, as we noted last week, former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz is thinking about running for president. Some of his key supporters wonder why he did not decide to run years ago. Schultz's response, better latte than never. And that's Ruckus for this week. We'll be back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.